Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first sculpture hand axe to figure stone symposium, part of the Nasher's 360 speaker series. I am curator of education, Anna Smith, and I'm going to share with you the most important information first, which is that we have coffee service available outside of Nasher Hall if you need a little pick me up in between presentations. Uh, the Nasher Sculpture Center is a museum of modern and contemporary sculpture. We are not a museum of natural history, nor of archaeology, nor of anthropology. Yet, the objects displayed in first sculpture, hand axe to figure stone, normally find homes in such institutions. But the artists included in the Nasher collection, artists who have worked from the middle of the 19th century to the present day, these artists have been deeply concerned with the origins of art with discovering and tapping into that which is most fundamental to art, whether by employing techniques intended to draw out in conscious states, finding inspiration in visual traditions once considered, mistakenly we would now argue, primitive, and following strategies of formal reduction, these artists revolutionized art, created masterpieces, and laid the foundations for artistic strategies that continue to be practiced and extended today. So, when the Nasher was presented the opportunity to organize an exhibition that would consider the most ancient of artifacts, objects made by our near-human ancestors as far back as 2.3 million years ago, from an aesthetic perspective, it seemed an intriguing, even natural fit. The objects gathered here suggest that artistic strategies and mental structures that have underpinned human art making for millennia are far more ancient and fundamental than is commonly understood, and that the core principles of art making are so fundamental to humanity that they antedate modern humans. The idea for first sculpture, Hand Axe to Figure Stone, came to us from an artist, Tony Berlant, who then teamed up with an anthropologist, Thomas Wynn. Together, they visited museums and private collections in North America, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, finding exceptional and fascinating examples of Paleolithic stone carving, which are assembled in this exhibition. As they move forward with the project, their thinking and understanding continue to develop. Tony and Tom also assembled a remarkable and exceptionally distinguished group of formal and informal advisors from a variety of disciplines, who offered a range of ideas and expertise. And that team has, along with Tony and Tom, contributed essays to our catalog. The arguments advanced in first sculpture, hand axe to figure stone, are not without controversy, and partly for that reason, and also simply to advance our understanding of this complex and compelling topic, we thought to organize today's program in which several of our catalog authors, as well as an expert in the fields of engineering and neuroscience, will present papers, followed by a general moderated discussion. Our panelists are... Tony Berlant, a celebrated contemporary American artist known for his mixed media sculptural collages. He also has extensive experience in humanitarian research from his work as a research affiliate for the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. Berlant's work can be seen in collections around the country, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. In Dallas, an exhibition of Berlant's work will be on view at Tally Dunn Gallery through February 24th. Dr. Thomas Wynn is a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Dr. Wynn's academic career is focused in the study of anthropology, specifically exploring the use of psychological theory in the interpretation of archaeological remains. During his career, Dr. Wynn has published four books, including The Evolution of Spatial Competence, 1989, The Rise of Homo Sapiens, The Evolution of Modern Thinking, with F. Coolidge, 2009, and How to Think Like a Neanderthal, with F. Coolidge, 2012. In addition to his books, Dr. Wynn is recognized for his 1979 article, The Intelligence of Later Archelian Hominids, which continues to be referenced as one of the leading and foundational authorities on the subject of evolutionary cognitive archaeology. Dr. John Gowlett is a professor of archaeology in the Department of Archaeology, Classics, and Egyptology at the University of Liverpool. He has conducted extensive research on human evolution throughout the last two million years. His specific area of study was tracing the preconditions and origins of human conceptualizing abilities, which led to later developments such as art and mathematics. Within this area, he continues to apply a heavy focus on the discovery and use of fire by early humans. Dr. Gallet was a director of the British Academy's centenary project, Lucy to Language, and along with colleagues Clive Gamble and Robin Dunbar, has written Thinking Big, 
How the Evolution of Social Life Shaped the Human Mind, 2018. Recently, Dr. Gallup conducted substantial fieldwork in Eastern and Southern Africa. Richard Deacon is a celebrated British sculpture with a career spanning four decades. The theme in Mr. Deacon's art is that of fabrication, where he marries the physical and metaphorical. Physically, there is the construction and fabrication of the sculpture itself, while metaphorically, there is the notion of creation and fabrication in the creative genius of the sculpture. Mr. Deacon has had numerous solo exhibitions throughout his career at international venues, including Tate Britain in London and the Contemporary Art Center in New York. Dr. Leanne Young is the executive director of the Brain Performance Institute at the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas, and is a nationally recognized expert in blast injury research. Dr. Young achieved great notoriety when she worked with the Department of Defense's Combating Terrorism Technology Support Office to obtain the first histological evidence of primary blast-induced brain injuries. By combining her two fields of study, engineering and neuroscience, Dr. Young has implemented virtual reality-based characterization into the treatment of functionally impaired patients with traumatic brain injuries. Dr. Nama Goran Inbar is a respected archaeologist whose main focus is on the prehistoric archaeology of Israel, specifically within the Jordan and Hula Valleys. Presently, Dr. Goran Inbar is a professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her countless excavations and explorations into Israel's archaeological past have led to groundbreaking discoveries into the lives and habits of hominins. Discoveries yielded through her work include the earliest evidence outside of Africa of fire control, evidence of advanced technological abilities, and the unearthing of a figurine that is considered the earliest art object in the world. Our moderator for today's panel is Lee Cullum, a nationally respected journalist with vast experience in television, radio, and print programs. Currently, she is the host of CEO, a KERA original monthly series of interviews with business leaders across North Texas. Previously, Ms. Cullum was a commentator for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer and All Things Considered on NPR. She has also served as editor of the editorial page of the Dallas Times Herald and host of Conversations, a series on KERA featuring major newsmakers. Ms. Cullum has also worked as a reporter, on-air moderator, and executive producer of Newsroom on KERA. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the contribution excuse me, the contributions made by Jared Diamond, Evan Moore, and V.S. Ramachandran to the first sculpture exhibition catalog. Dr. Diamond's preface raises broad and thought-provoking questions about the evolutionary role of aesthetic displays, while Dr. Moore and Dr. Ramachandran enrich the dialogue surrounding the objects in first sculpture by reframing them through the respective contexts of surrealism and neuroscientists. I'll also tell you that I will be working as the front-end AV for today, so if you'll allow me one moment to bring up the first presentation, I'll introduce our first speakers. We will begin today's program with a presentation on the inspiration and scholarly pursuit of first sculpture. Please join me now in welcoming exhibition curators Tony Berlant and Thomas Wynn. in love with the objects in the exhibition, I want to uh, encourage you outside of this room when you're looking at the objects to enter a state of dropping any disbelief and just uh, going to the experiential as opposed to the analytic, just as you would, if possible, when you go into the adjoining room, which shows the great modern and contemporary sculptures that have a kind of kindred uh, spirit to the objects in our exhibition. Um, this is not as uh, easy to do for uh, the general audience as one might think, but I think that it's something that you do in all artworks. And for me, every object in our exhibition has a living presence that transcends time and culture and place and is still vitally present. So I think that to deeply understand the objects, first of all, we have a few that you can actually handle, which is crucial. And secondly, uh, to try not to think as much as to feel to understand the objects. 
Com. So we're going to try to do a tag team kind of thing here. But the stage edge. Yeah, but you can be careful not to fall off. The right, stage. the stage edge is right here, and one of us is going to fall. So uh, I'm hoping it's Tony. So it's worth it for the attention you get. So um, starting uh, almost five years ago, you know, Tony and I traveled to museums around Europe and the Middle East and Africa looking for objects for this uh, exhibition. And I do have to admit, we had a great time. Um, but we worked very, very, very hard, um, but we had a great time. Um, so uh, here we are having arrived too early for the opening of the museum and are, are looking sort of, uh, I guess, unhappy about that. But, um, but what I thought I would do uh, for the few minutes that we have is actually talk about some of the objects themselves and uh, some of the important, uh, perhaps controversial issues that come up around them. And uh, the first object uh, is the earliest one, which is the Makapanskot pebble. This is an unmodified object, uh, so it was found. Um, so why do we think it is, has anything to do with the evolution of human thinking or the evolution of human aesthetic behavior? Well, somebody, 2.3 million years ago, we think, um, picked up this object and carried it away, or home, if you want to think about it in, in those terms. And the question is why? That is, why would arguably an Australopithecus at this point, it's not even genus homo, why would they pick up this object and carry it? And I think the reason is obvious. You all see, when you look at this pebble, uh, you see something. And I would guess the vast majority of you see a face. Uh, this is a pattern that primates are very good at detecting. You're very good at detecting. Monkeys are very good at detecting it. We've evolved to do it. We rely very heavily on faces for social behavior. So there are very good reasons for us to attend to faces. But from an anthropological point of view, um, I think the key issue is the picking it up and carrying it home. I mean, recognizing the face is not really remarkable. It doesn't really tell us anything particular about these hominins that we wouldn't already know. But that they were paying attention to objects and looking closely at objects, I think, is an interesting piece of information about what these hominins were like. I think the, the, the most contentious questions I had last night had to do with spheroids. And there, there are two spheroids on the screen here. One is in the, the exhibition, which is the giant spheroid from Ubedia uh, in Israel. Um, more typical are, is the spheroid from Olduvai Gorge, um, size-wise anyway. Uh, unfortunately, for various reasons, this object didn't make it in, into the exhibition. But uh, what I was asked was, couldn't these be natural objects? I mean, don't we find these things all of the time in gravel deposits? And the answer is, well, no, not really. Um, I mean, how often do you find absolutely spherical objects in gravel? I suppose once in a very long time you might, but that's not the most parsimonious understanding of these objects. And these, these are made by crushing and pecking. That is, somebody was using the object to pound uh, and in the process produced a spherical shape. And that's, I think, the, the point that Tony and I are trying to make is that the very earliest manifestations of uh, an aesthetic desire, I suppose, occurs in artifacts and the imposition of some very basic shapes, uh, including spherical shapes. And then the second basic shape um, would be bilateral symmetry. Um, this is a, arguably one of the oldest hand axes in the world from the Kenyan side of Kokoseli. Uh, and even here, you, you can see a, a basic, not only bilateral symmetry, but some of you may detect a face in this particular artifact as, as well. We don't know whether that was intended, but uh, it, it certainly is an aspect of, of the artifact. But what we have here in the Tabulbala hand axe is, in a sense, the same artifact, but um, with a more carefully uh, produced shape. And we think that's actually very important uh, because of something we, we call overdetermination. And 
These are two uh, artifacts that are in the exhibition. Uh, this is the uh, hand axe from Gesher Benot Yerkov uh, in Israel and the hand axe from Katupan in South Africa. If you haven't seen the exhibition, uh, these are really beautiful artifacts. So the question, of, from a sort of evolutionary point of view, is uh, why would you invest all of the time and effort to produce an artifact that's visually appealing when it doesn't actually have any effect on the functionality of the tool. And that's what we mean by overdetermination. And it's that extra addition that is the clue to these being aesthetic objects. That is not just being functional objects, but having an aesthetic component. And both of these are hundreds of thousands of years old. So Tony, did you want to add anything at this point? Well, just, just uh, I was struck by the fact that a photograph is a very inadequate surrogate for the actual experience. Again, that first image of that little face, which is uh, the word unique object is often overused, but it is truly a totally unique object. And then the, the image, on, which is wonderful on our catalog front, and in this image, it has a kind of an aggressive uh, look. And when I saw it here, I had the wonderful experience of seeing the actual object, it was very sweet and reassuring. It was a thing that I would pick up and even today and it would become a And a you real, did pick it up. Uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> I think. I mean, any object like that would have, that object is a living presence for me and it's a very reassuring presence where the image is always photographed to make it more expressionistic and dramatic. It's a it's a kind, kind companion for me. And the, the second issue that I think both of these artifacts um, exemplify is, is what we started to call exceptionalism. Um, Katupan is a very good uh, example. Um, we went through many crates of hand axes from the site of Katupan, and um, most of them are sort of mediocre, vaguely symmetrical, um, not particularly attractive. And then there's this one absolutely gorgeous artifact. And it turns out that that's not an unusual pattern for artifacts in this time period. Uh, that is, we have sites where there are lots of sort of standard average hand axes, and then a few that have been invested with much more effort. And we don't really quite understand why that's the case. But it seems to be a real phenomenon and one that calls out for explanation. Well, even now, it's kind of a total enigma why certain individuals who we call artists are involuntarily uh, committed to do this and being, are obsessed with making a, a mental construct physical. And uh, this was, for me, the biggest shock uh, in looking at these enormous uh, institutional collections. I, I remember when, when we first started, actually at the first institution we went to, we went through a lot of hand axes and many of them were nice. Um, but Tony kept shaking his head. Why is he shaking his head? Why, these are perfectly nice hand axes. Um, it, but it, it turned out that they weren't, in, in a sense, spectacularly different. And, you know, and, when, and when you see the ones that are different, it's very clear that uh, more effort has been invested in these. Um, it's very, we think it's very significant, it is very significant, that even though we come from such different backgrounds, as we were standing side by side, opening and closing literally thousands of drawers, one of us would pull open a drawer without discussion, without even reflection. Both of us, our hands would go right to the same object. And I think because the aesthetic of that object was like a neurological key that, that opened a, a, a felt but not understood uh, pleasure and satisfaction. And something else that surprised both of us is the number of times we saw this kind of thing uh, where uh, the hand axe has framed, in this case, a, a crystal pocket, but also a face. You can see that there's a very dramatic face in this hand axe. And this famous one that was on the invitation is the West Toffs hand axe, which, um, although someone tried to explain to me last night how this could have been an accident, um, I, I was not moved. 
by, 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 the, by the argument. Um, so, uh, I mean, very, very clearly, this was the focus of this particular artifact. Um, and it's been carefully trimmed around. Otherwise, the artifact is not particularly remarkable. I mean, if you remove the, the shell, it's, you know, excuse my language, but ugly, as, as, as hand axes go. Um, but, but the shell really makes it dramatic. And, this, and we found artifacts like this far more often than we thought. And we have a number of them with holes and crystals and so forth in the exhibition. And that this uh, impulse of framing comes r right down to the contemporary moment. Uh, framing the point of interest within a rectangular format, which is, we know now that the, the rectangular format is very satisfying neurologically. And we don't even consider it. We just take it for granted. When you take your camera and take a snapshot, uh, you're doing two things related for me to the hand axe. One, you're making an artifact that's external to yourself that reassures yourself that I do exist, and here's the document. But you also automatically put the center of interest in the middle of the picture, unless you gradually become jaded by wanting to make a little variation, and then you throw it off uh, to the side. But we, this framing uh, impulse is uh, something that we hadn't thought a lot about in, in advance, but one of the things that we discovered in looking at pieces. Um, well, I think one of the more interesting things from my point of view that, that we did uh, was in 2015 at, at the British Museum um, storage in, in London. And you can see some people you recognize here. Here's Richard Deacon here. Uh, John Gallet, who'll be talking later, is here. This is Dr. Natalie Uomini from um, uh, Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Uh, this is Dr. Freddie Fools from the University of Durham. And both of them at, uh, earlier had mentioned to me that they thought it might be possible to recognize individual artisans in the Boxgrove hand axes. So um, Tony and I, Tony had come to the same conclusion that this might be possible. So we invited uh, Richard Deacon to meet us at, uh, at, at Frank's house. And for two days, we went through the uh, boxes and boxes of hand axes that come from uh, Box Grove. And of course, they, they had tight control. We weren't supposed to lift up more than one at a time. We weren't supposed to actually hand them to one another. Uh, they, they were very draconian. And of course, as soon as they walked out of the room, we disobeyed them. <laughs> um, um, but but we, we did try, try to be careful. But um, but. But the idea was to, to see if different groups of scholars from different perspectives could identify individual artisans. And it turns out, and you can see in the exhibition, that they agreed on four groups of hand axes, each of which was manufactured by a different stone napper, which I thought was really quite remarkable, coming at it from, from different directions. And I think it's significant we didn't have any uh, articulated discussion. Uh, people just wrote down numbers. So there wasn't the social factor involved. And, and I, I think, sat off and drank coffee and watched. That was, that was my And opinion. I think we were all amazed. I think we were both, both groups, uh, the archaeologists and the art people were, uh, we were amazed at the uh, coherence. And, and yesterday, a number of people asked me, what kinds of technical things did the archaeologists look, look for? And um, the group that is, this is, I think, most clear is this particular group. And as you can you can see that the stone napper struck the, after finishing the hand axe, struck the hand axe up here and stripped off a long flake of stone. You can see the ridges here. Um, this is what's known as a tranché blow, and there are various ways to do this. There, the point appears to be to thin out the tip. The other point is to impress your friends and relatives, because if you do it wrong, you break the artifact. Um, and so if you can see, this, the, there seems to be the, the same sort of, angle at which the uh, napper was doing the tranché blows on this. And that's one of the kinds of technical issues that the archaeologists use to identify the individual nappers. There were a number of others, so that, that wasn't it. But actually, if you don't even worry about that and sort of look at the artifacts just with sort of a general you know, impression, uh, they do seem to speak to you as, as you as if they're the same. It, it's very strange. And I'm, maybe I'm hypnotizing myself. But, but the more, time, more I look at them, the more I'm convinced of the, the groupings. That may say a little bit more about me than. Yeah, but I think it's people. very much like the same cognitive, where you have much more cognitive ability 
than we're consciously aware of. That's why all of us can recognize hundreds of voices on the phone when the person just says hello. And if you're asked to list the aspects of the voice that made you make this uh, uh, conclusion, you don't do it that way. It just tastes the same, it looks the same, it feels the same, where, uh, uh, because I have hearing problems, I'm very aware of that we learn to uh, lip read without ever being taught, which is very complicated. Uh, so I think with, we just can recognize things based on criteria that are not consciously uh, developed. Just like when you know somebody well and you see them even two blocks away, uh, before you can really even identify the figure, just from the stance, you know it's that person. Uh, that you know, and I feel like we have the same kind of an experience um, with a Picasso or with a hand axe. And so I, I think 500,000 years ago when these hand axes were manufactured, um, somebody in the group, if they saw one of these hand axes on the ground, would know who it was who made it. And I think that's, that's a very interesting phenomenon. I get five more minutes. <laughs> so. Um, finally, I, well, among the, from the, at least an archaeological point of view, perhaps the most controversial of, of the artifacts are what we're calling the, the Bentagene zoomorphs. And um, I don't think that it's particularly controversial that these artifacts have an animal shape. I mean, if you look at them, we have the, the, the neck and the back and shoulder and the ear and the, the nose of what appears to be an equid, to speak scientifically. We just refer to them as horses. Of course, they come from the Sahara Desert, so there weren't horses there, but there might have been wild asses or zebras, so a, a, an equid-like creature. Um, this one has a, a similar resemblance here. So um, the, the issue is not so much whether they look like animals, but whether they're as old as I say they are. That's really kind of the issue, because these are a surface find. Um, so the provenance of these artifacts is the real sticking point. They were recovered by a French army officer in 1979 and 1980. Of course, you may ask the question, what is a French army officer doing in Algeria in 1979 and 1980? But I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but it's way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you can actually Google this, and it's about as remote a place as you can find. Um, but 300,000 years ago, it was a grassland, and Homo heidelbergensis and animals lived there. Um, so why do we think it's 300,000 years old? Well, a lot of it has to do with the manufacturing technique. That is, the way the horse was manufactured. And for the Paleolithic archaeologists in the group, and you can raise your hand, and I would be surprised to see any, but um, um, if, if you look at the, the contour of the head from this perspective, you can see these ridges. And these ridges are what are left behind from a manufacturing technique. It's what we sometimes refer to as a prepared core manufacturing technique, um, probably something known as Tshengi technique um, in Algerian archaeology. Uh, and then the, the, this produced a large flake, and then the stone napper removed these small flakes to sort of carve out the throat and the, uh, and, and the neck of the animal. And the stone napper actually was much better than this, but he wasn't trying or she wasn't trying to thin out the artifact. He was actually trying to make this shape, to produce this shape. But it's this clue that um, tells us the artifact is probably about 300,000 years old because that particular manufacturing technique uh, is typical of the Algerian Paleolithic in that time period. Um, and interestingly, this is about the same age as the Barakat Ram figurine that uh, Nama Ninbar found uh, just a few years ago, right, Nama? And, and um, uh, so what, what we have then is, is evidence of, of figurative production in stone tools. And this is something that, no, as far as I know, archaeologists haven't really recognized before. Um, so we think this is, this is really quite important. And uh, Tony, did you want to add anything on? Well, just that we recognize them instantaneously. I mean, it didn't take more than a couple of seconds. But also that uh, these objects often have 
uh, shape-shifting identities. So it is a, you bring your neurology and interpretation to each object. And I believe that in many cases, not so much in this case, um, ambiguity uh, and shape-shifting is a uh, quality that they liked. We don't like it because you don't get your story straight. Right. Um, and of course, some of the more evocative are artifacts in the exhibition time. My watch says two minutes, okay. Uh, um, you'll love these. These, these are the, the figure stones um, from Fontmore. Uh, Fontmore is a Neanderthal site. Um, there are some provenance issues for these artifacts also, but I'm, I don't think they're really very serious. Um, these are found objects that have been modified to sort of frame them. So they've been uh, trimmed around the edges a little bit. Um, and you can see the faces. I don't think that's, that's difficult. Um, you, someone mentioned earlier that I've written a book called How to Think Like a Neanderthal. Um, this fits right in with some of the things we talk about in that book. This, we don't have to conclude that Neanderthals had some deep philosophical issues uh, because we have figure stones. They can recognize faces just like we can, and they could celebrate faces just like we do. And uh, Tony is, probably has more to say about figure stones than, than me, and I know we're out of time, but we only have one more slide. Well, so. I think it's quite um, wonderful that this guy looks so much like me. Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not just... Of course, in, the implication uh, is the other one looks like me. But in, in, in attitude... Uh, more than physiology. Well, the attitude works for me, too, on the so, other uh, uh, But it, uh, I think I want you all to be sure to understand that everything that's in the face is a naturally found occurrence. And as you'll see in <clears throat> the exhibition, the holes in the face go all the way through the piece, and you can just imagine the sense of magic uh, that one felt when you came upon something like this and fully deliberated it and it was a living uh, presence. And this is what happens when you look at the Mona Lisa. It transcends the paint and the canvas, which we all know what it is. It transcends the historical moment, and it becomes a specific, wonderful presence. So thank you very much. Well, so our next presentation will be titled The World of Hand Axes, The Spread and Scope of Their Existence in History. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Gowlett. Thank you. First, I, I'm really delighted to be here, and I really just want a second to pay tribute to the vision of Tony and Tom and Nasha in putting this together in a way that people have just not thought to do beyond our ordinary archaeology. So I, I really think it is something very special. Second, when you're not sure, and it's a little bit intimidating, it's tremendously reassuring to be holding a hand axe. <laughs> <laughs> out in the bush or in the talk. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll come back to that. It's a fake, by the way. Um, and the third thing is uh, I, I think my task is to try and give you a, a deluge, a torrent of hand axes to see us through. And you may say, well, that's too much. And then in a way, that's the message because that's how, that, that, that's how big they are. So if I don't get through the torrent, well, you can kick me off at the end. So... Um, here we are. So first, I think uh, echoing something that Tony said, that, that, that something that transcends there, and there's a kind of first moment when you, you meet the Ashulean. And for me, it happened many years ago at Columbia. That's me sitting in the distance there because I'd wanted to study the earlier tools, the older one, and I was told, no, you can't, there's not space, go and study the hand axis. And, well, that, that's how it happened for me, and we're, we're still there. But we all have that kind of sense of something special, and, uh, uh, and you're making something special in the, in the actual land. So this is roughly what I'd like to talk about 
the dis that they have the design content that we see so long, more than one and a, well, more than one and a half million years of it, which is amazing, and then all around the world, and then all this added value in the art as well. So I'll zip through. There's this technology alone. It, it, it's something rare that, that, that hominins had to struggle to get there, practicing their technology, discovering that you could do things with stone. And we now know, we now know that that seems to happen more than three million years ago. And then we have the simple old one lasting for that period of time. And then enter the Ashulen. I think first the recognition goes back to France and the name. So there's the importance of that work back in the 19th century. But of course nobody knew that actually you'd find the hand axes much further back in Africa, much deeper in time. So it's interesting to look at the first signs because they're doing something that is, in a way, amazing. It seems so obvious to us now that it's, it's a perfect design package. But in some way, they had to get from something like this, a, a sort of glob of stone, to something extended like this with all its edges and so on. And there was nobody to tell you how to do it. I think it, it is really our first proper design and somehow they got it together. So there are these first few sites in Africa that take us back. I'll work around the world rapidly. But these go back towards two million years. We don't know how far we'll get. So amazing work at Kokisule, West Tokana, by that team. That's about the oldest. But on the other side of Lake Tokana, in Ethiopia, there's Konso Gardula, and these are really early. And just a couple of things about them. Look on the left, the cleavers that you'll see in the exhibition are already there. They're not a late design. So already they've got the cleavers as well as hand axes. And if you look at the ones up there on the top right, look, they're all a little bit bent. So that, so that seemed to be something now. I haven't seen that elsewhere apart from the ones that uh, Tom and Tony were showing that are different. So maybe e even at the start, people are doing local things, special, again, in some way to them. Now, the really famous one is Old Vai Gorge. Maybe not quite so old, but you have in the exhibition a really fine one of quartz. So again, that's something special. It's really tough to work quartz, especially in big bifaces, but they're doing it. And you can see one of those that, that Louis Leakey found there. Now, the one I know much better is Chesuanja in Kenya. And the bifaces, the hand axes here are about one and a half million years. Now, look at that one on the right. You see it's made on a big cobble. And maybe the cobble is one of the first things that giving them away in. That if you see the right shape of cobble, you could even make a hand axe. Most of them, though, are on flakes. So thinking again of this, the, just this idea of how the ideas struggle together, it's really interesting that there's one output, the hand axe, but there are actually three different ways of making it at least, from the big cobble, from the big flake, or from a nodule that you work. And doesn't that, in a way, emphasize the hand axe itself? It, that it's so important that you will find different ways of making it if you have to. So who was doing this quickly? The, well, probably Homo erectus at the beginning. But they went on for so long that, that we are probably ending up with species much more like ourselves at the end. And that, again, is, is a fascinating thing. I've got to keep on. So a million years ago, there's a kind of group of them that comes. Several places through northeast Africa. Karyandusi in Kenya was found by Louis Leakey. 
look at the obsidian hand axis there. Then, perhaps even more famous, Olegosili in Kenya. And Louis Leakey had the brilliant idea of making the catwalk. So he, it's a wonderful display, and you, you, you're with it. You're with the hand axis. And again, we see in the exhibit how important the, the display is. This is, well, just look at Olegosili. Look at the torrents of hand axis. Now, we find this again at Kilombi. Look at them all also about a million years old, also in Kenya. There's an odd one. They keep surprising us. Look, top left. <laughs> Alongside the GPS. <laughs> the trend-pointed one. Cornelia, South Africa, again, a million years old, the same uh, 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 again. So by a million years ago, it was going really strong. And having got to South Africa, let's just hang on there. This is the River Vaal. There are many sites along the Vaal. And you might be amazed what I show you next is from one morning's prospecting in some diamond workings where they let us in because we, we said we knew nothing about hand act. We, no, say, they, we said we knew nothing about diamonds and they said that was good. And <laughs> we were. Um, so that just shows there are so many out there. And more than one and a half million years ago, they're spreading out across the world through Asia. Maybe you'd get even earlier dates. I'm only touching for a second on Israel because I know Nama will say great things about Gesher. Ubaidir is early. There are many sites there. Now, across Asia, so far, so many sites. I only pick up one because I think this is fantastic work that's going on. This is the work by Shanti Papu um, and colleagues on the eastern side of India. So again, they've got very early dates. Look at all those hand axes. Um, so it's one example, but I think it, it's, it's very special. Then, as you get further, there's a question whether there really are hand axes in the Far East. So some of us managed to see the ones in Korea, at Cheonggokri, and they certainly look like hand axes, they certainly feel like hand axes, so perhaps they are hand axes, and in any case, the work of pre presenting them is wonderful, and the Koreans do scale up sometimes. So um, you've got these big, big hand axes on the wall, and people doing the stone napping, which is just, an, just another very interesting and exciting aspect of display. Well, I've still got Europe. Um, lots. Well, we'll touch on them. Spain, Ambrona, Toralba. They could be, some are nearly a million years old. There's a link with elephants at Ambrona. And you can see them. So there's some association. So probably at least sometimes they were butchering elephants with hand axes. There are some good cases. But also in Spain, look at a variety, fine flint specimens. And then somewhere else here, large quartzite ones. So different style, very dramatic that they're making these. Now, when did it end? How did, how did it begin to end? Well, we don't really understand, but maybe it was the evolution or development of hafting that made it a little bit easier. So there are blades. That's South Africa. This is Kenya. So look at the variety Kesem from Israel. Suddenly there's more variety in the tools, and maybe that's beginning to say hand axes, your time is coming up, probably a bit like mine. And I got to show Henri de Lumley um, in France, though, where again he's, he's, he's on the right hand side, his, his site of Terra Amata, but then he's showing us another site where there are very late hand axes, and that again is tricky. Um, so they don't just come and go. The end is a bit of a puzzle, but the hafting might be part of it. Now, other little things just to throw in. The sociality, Beaches, Pitt's an example. 
There's a case where someone's trying to make a hand axe by the fire, and in the end they fail, but one or two of the flakes become burnt as they're making it. And then this one, uh, by, side by side with that, broken in half, and I thought it was really interesting. Now, they were trying to retrim it at that time. The person was trying to retrim it, and it broke, and the two bits are just that far apart. I don't know what you would do. I think I would throw one, but they, they, they didn't mind too much. That, you know. So, um, to conclude, other people can talk much more about the aesthetics, but there are all these interesting things in there. And I just want to say, really, that certainly sometimes the exceptional ones that Tom and Tony were talking about definitely now go back a full million years. So, um, you know, it's not long ago we thought that was half a million years, but they're there sometimes at a million years. And... The symmetry breaking, I think, is really interesting. I think, you, I think you can see, if you look around the exhibition, you can see that even the most symmetrical ones are sometimes very slightly asymmetric. And I think that may be deliberate. If you look at this one, it's got a curve and a straight side. So there's something interesting in there, maybe about, maybe about the use of them. It's something to explore a lot more. So we can play around looking at measurements. The size is important. The proportion, Tony was mentioning, the rectangles. Um, a lot of them are made in the so-called golden section where you've got the two proportions 0.61 to 1, and it occurs in many hand axes. But they worked them. They had to get this long shape. In this case, here, here's one from Colombi where we know they made a big oval flake first, but we know they wanted long, slender hand axes to come out of it because that's what they do. And we can see that they're sort of trimming a little bit from the sides. So the failed one on the left is, really helps to show the success in, in the others. Alongside those, there are tiny ones. Wow, really tiny ones. And finishing, balance. It's really important. They all balance really nicely, so we should just mention that. And they kind of stabilize. So in a funny way, they're a bit like a screwdriver, except they're made so they won't turn from side to side. And I think that's just another little thing to throw in. So I think I would argue that there's some sort of link there. Um, perhaps other people would talk about this, but the aesthetics of it, it's perhaps linked that the function drives towards the aesthetics is what I'm trying to, to, to say, that they're complicated. You have to get quite a lot of things right to make a hand axe like this, and maybe that triggers these things that are there in the aesthetics. Okay, now, am I okay? Am I just about? Because if I can do this, that's it. Um, I just wanted for one second to show you This is, whoops, this is, this is, just a, this, this is a 360 shot of Lewis Leakey's excavations at Carrie and Ducey, and I think it just brings home to you, just look at them. It's the way you can pan around and see them, the size of, of them. So hand axes in, in the wild. Uh, um, and again, the other Carrie and Ducey site, just look at these. 
there. So the ones you've got here are very, very special. Um, one last one. So that's, again, Kilombi. Uh, the hand X is actually coming out. Do you see them? Do you see the numbers of them? So I'll stop. So that's the out there. And uh, what's wonderful is the way that, is that things have come together here. So thank you very much. I'll stop. Our next presentation will be titled Day in the Life, Material Evidence of Hand Axes and Their Uses in Everyday Life with Richard Deacon. Thanks. <clears throat> <clears throat> Actually, that's not the title of my talk. Uh, um, I'm going to talk really about uh, uh, evidence and the uses of evidence, and I'm going to focus on uh, um, the, what we decided, what we came, the conclusions we came to when looking at the box grove material, and uh, uh, and to try and spin out why I think it's important. The, uh, uh, what you see on the screen is a um, reproduction from the Guardian newspaper in the UK from 1995, which is around uh, just um, uh, a year or so after I really began seriously thinking about all this stuff. Um, the, uh, uh, the, and this is to do with the identification of a painting by Turner. You probably can't see it. It says, uh, uh, police expert puts the finger on a lost work by Turner. So uh, the authentic authentication of uh, uh, the painting was um, down to them finding a fingerprint of Turner's on the painting, which provided uh, indutable evidence uh, that this was indeed uh, a painting of Turner's. And it's that... Um, uh, so to begin with, let's take a, a kind of ride on that uh, um, idea of, uh, um, uh, of evidence. Uh, <clears throat> how do we know that um, 350, 370 million years ago, um, <clears throat> salamander-like animals, tetrapods, came out of the sea and walked on the land? We know because they left their footprints behind. This is the tetrapod trackway and also tail drag uh, that's in Valencia Island, just off the coast of Ireland. How do we know that dinosaurs walked across Texas? We know that 130 million years ago in the early Cretaceous. We know that because they left their footprints behind. And there's a lot of dinosaur footprints in Texas. How do we know uh, that 3.6 million years ago, uh, a pair of hominids walked across um, the northern Tanzania uh, in Laterly? We know it because Mary Leakey discovered their, uh, uh, this track, trackway. Um, and... Incidentally, and John has mentioned the hand axe um, up in the display, uh, which is uh, from slightly later. This is from Laterly. The hand axe up in the, is the courtside hand axe comes from Olduvai, which is about 15 miles away from Laterly. Um, and uh, uh, for a nerd like myself, um, seeing that, upstairs is kind of extremely poignant uh, because not only is it an extraordinary hand axe um, but it's got on it Louis Leakey's handwriting uh, identifying the find uh, and the accession number is from 1934 um, uh, it belongs to Cambridge uh, and 
1933-34 was the first uh, dig that Mary Nichol, as she then was, and Louis Leakey did together. So there's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a poignant object, in a, apart from its kind of extraordinary uh, um, uh, qualities in itself. It also brings with it a whole freight of uh, paleo <coughs> paleontological history. Um, how do we know that on the coast of England, 800,000 years ago, uh, hominids walked around? We know because they left the trackway. Uh, this is at Happersburg in Norfolk. And it is rather poignant. Um, the trackway was discovered by uh, um, uh, Nicholas Ashton uh, from the British Museum and Martin Bates from the University of St. David's who were working on a, a British Museum program called The Pathways of Ancient Britain. Uh, the trackway was exposed by a winter storm what it's composed of is a kind of mudstone. Uh, they had two weeks to scan, um, record, and get as much information as they could from this trackway and to establish that it was indeed um, a human trackway before storms washed it away again. Two weeks for an item that existed for 800,000 years ago and then was gone again. Um, how do we know that in the Cro-Magnon period, about 25,000 years ago, at Peshmerl in France, um, an adolescent walked across? We know that because he left his footprint behind. How do we know that Neil Armstrong walked along the moon in 1969? We know that because he left his footprint behind. How do we know that the devil, on passing Munich Cathedral, kick the walls. We know that because he left his footprint <laughs> behind. Um, so uh, the truth is sometimes uh, not as obvious uh, as you think. And looking like is, is not only a human uh, and the ability to recognize looking like is not only a, a function of our uh, human, human or even our hominid an ancestry. It occurs uh, throughout nature. Uh, this is a flatfish, the same species, making a good impression of being a polka dot um, on one and making another good impression of being a piece of, uh, um, a piece of gravel. Uh, this is Batesian mimicry in insects where uh, the predator, uh, <coughs> a wasp in the top picture, uh, is mimicked by the prey uh, uh, in order to avoid being eaten. Uh, a beetle in the bottom, bottom insect. This is a bee orchid uh, that does a pretty good imitation of a female bee um, being mated with by uh, uh, a male bee. And as, it, as the male bee performs his job, uh, this little dop comes down and drops uh, pollen onto his, uh, uh, onto his back, which he then takes off uh, and uh, spreads to other bee orchids. Of course, that looking like um, is something we, uh, we do, and as artists we play with it a lot, but we all do this. Uh, these are scholars' rocks from China, uh, which are um, supposedly natural, um, uh, naturally occurring rocks, weather weathered rocks, uh, which are used as aids, were used as aids for, to the imagination by uh, uh, Ming and Song Dynasty scholars in, uh, in China. And the, uh, there's an interesting conjunction of uh, the natural with the uh, uh, artificial. And the bases kind of amplify that, uh, 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 that resource, that uh, uh, ability to um, uh, excite the imagination. Uh, and looking like can also turn to something a little bit darker, where uh, uh, we all use, this is a 19th century map of Ireland, where there's a, a, a stereotypical view of the Irish uh, is presented within the frame of their map. Uh, and this is a 1950s Franz Dimanche uh, cover, um, where, uh, which mocks 
the ideas of the um, Darwinian ideas of descent to suggest that uh, uh, looking like um, to look like something is to have uh, their characteristics and very care cleverly poses uh, the photographs of the animals uh, with the celebrity, some of whom you uh, you will recognise. So Sartre uh, on the left and the goldfish, De Gaulle abo uh, above. Uh, with that, with the canine, the others have kind of vanished into the um, kind of history of um, uh, late 20th century France. Uh, and lastly, uh, which comes brings us back to starts to bring us back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, this is the Romano. These are these uh, here are. Uh, is a transcription of a thing called the Romana Rock in Sweden, uh, which was long considered to be a... Uh, um, uh, these were thought to be runes uh, and were uh, um, even translated by Scandinavian scholars to provide an early history of uh, um, runic poetry. Uh, unfortunately... Um, Geologists later kind of established beyond doubt that these are, uh, um, <clears throat> in fact, naturally occurring marks as a result of glaciation of the rock. So that, uh, um, on the one hand, it can seem to be foolish uh, that scholars would translate that. On the other hand, you can see it as a richness that uh, uh, the um, uh, that there is a way of interpreting. Uh, uh, reading those signs uh, to, conjecture, to conjecture something out of it. Um, the Boxgrove site in uh, southern England uh, is a kind of was an extraordinary excavation. Um, it is the largest. Uh, I'll read from the preface. This is the cover for the online. Um, uh, edition of the very scholarly uh, um, <coughs> work on the excavations at Boxgrove. It runs to about 400 pages, but it's a free download. Um, so if you are interested, just uh, um, track English Heritage and, uh, uh, and Boxgrove, and you can get this. You can get the, the whole thing as a download for, for nothing. And it's a fantastically scholarly document and deeply informed. Um, and in the preface to the book, it says, uh, uh, it describes has been that actually Sussex on the uh, uh, east to the south coast of England was not particularly known as being a site of uh, um, Paleolithic uh, finds. There were one or two uh, um, um, hand axes and one or two fossils, but it wasn't a particularly rich area. Uh, but then... Um, uh, this preface goes, <clears throat> the first hand axes were found at a place called Slindon Bottom. And then, to quote, there was little to suggest uh, that their discovery would lead eventually to excavation of the Boxgrove site, uh, revealing the largest area of any undisturbed lo lower Paleolithic land surface and, and, and uncovered in Britain. Also, with that, such a rare occurrence would be within a stratigraphy that tells a sequence of events that in itself is a major qu contribution to quaternary studies. Now, the, um, the site at Boxgrove, uh, the next slide is, this is the, uh, these are the quarry sites, Bo these are the quarry sites of Boxgrove. Uh, what's important about them uh, is that the, uh, the site is relatively uh, briefly available, I mean, briefly, really briefly, between 20 and 40 years. Uh, in the book, that, uh, in the account, there are eight different systems of dating used to establish um, uh, both the dating and the sequence of events at the, on the site. Uh, so that uh, re uh, really what happened, uh, it's a... Uh, um, a cliff face um, the, with exposed flint nodules along it, 
the sea level drops, exposing a kind of mud, a kind of brackish mud flat, and uh, a, uh, a soil kind of develops along uh, along that, which renders it kind of habitable, and it becomes a uh, uh, it becomes a desirable site, overlooking a, overlooking a lagoon, um, backed up by a cliff, uh, uh, a source of material and a source of fresh water, uh, and uh, the site is occupied by a group of hominids, uh, but very briefly, because the sea returns uh, and covers the site with sand, so that all, so that uh, the evidence uh, gets buried until the excavation, which went on for ten years, in 1985 to 95, um, and uh, um, so when the site is excavated. Uh, what you have uh, across this land area is, um, uh, as it were, a Mary Celeste of uh, um, occupation. This stuff, the, what you, uh, and it's true of uh, um, Tom said the difference between surface find and uh, so, was talking about surface finds, but the, um, uh, these are in situ finds and. Uh, therefore, the, the excavation can read the site as um, providing information on what was happening at the time. The stuff hasn't been disturbed. It hasn't been uh, uh, rooted around. The weather hasn't turned up the thing. So that if one thing is next to another, it was there when it, it, was, it was next to it, uh, when, it was, uh, uh, when it was dropped. Um, both the long occupation, the... the, uh, the uh, the relatively short span of time uh, of the uh, use of the uh, Boxgrove site, uh, the availability of materials and the, uh, um, uh, and the high quality of uh, product, uh, of, of napped products, uh, suggest that there might be a possibility um, that you can... Um, that this is one group, and that you could identify uh, maybe the members of that group uh, by close examination of the uh, uh, of the artifacts. Um, just to give you an idea of the non uh, hand axe material from the site, this is a uh, uh, this is in the British Museum. Um, uh, and this is a table of uh, flakes from the site where the, uh, the laborious process of uh, putting this jigsaw puzzle back together uh, has begun. So these are some of these are things. So the, the, uh, uh, there, are, there are instances in the site where uh, a whole napping event uh, can be seen and the uh, Bits reassembled to from the core from the uh, from the nodule uh, to reveal to leaving behind the kind of blank of the core. Now, it, um, in my essay, I write about uh, um, uh, <coughs> a couple of scatters like this out on the mudflats uh, around the bones of a uh, uh, of a butchered horse, um, and the extraordinary fact that you can reconstruct from that evidence. A, uh, uh, a day in the life uh, of a um, uh, of a group of hominids: the horse dying, the people going out uh, quickly, uh, producing their tools on the spot uh, to butcher the uh, uh, to butcher and uh, uh, skin <coughs> the uh, the animal, and to l leave leaving the uh, uh, leaving the, the bones behind, having been, some of them having been broken for their marrows. Um, but uh, and then all of that one day event being kind of preserved in the uh, uh, in the record and, and think about it one day five hundred thousand years ago that you the archaeology can give you that it's miraculous um, and then the second thing is that um, the hand axes there are as i've said are of uh, um, very high quality. Though there are also um, clumsy ones, uh, and the clumsy ones look like they might be made by beginners or people or, or, or 
uh, apprentices or kids or whatever, so that uh, um, this, so the site is not uh, is not just a kind of uh, passing site, but is somehow used uh, uh, is is stable enough for the uh, for a group to be there and to have a kind of social life there, uh, and uh, uh, though there's not much evidence of them sleeping there, uh, but you also think that that makes good sense because in a time when major predators are uh, uh, are around you wouldn't really want your meat butchery site next to where you live you might think it wise to have it somewhere different um, so uh, at the um, invitation of uh, um, um, Tony and Tom uh, I went along as uh, someone who was interested in this stuff to try and uh, answer the question, given the, the quality of the archaeology, is it possible to perform the exercise that you could identify individual makers? You could say that, uh, um, yes, these, it, it, uh, it is in my opinion that these two, three, four, or whatever were made by the same person, the same hand. And as... Uh, 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 as Tom indicated, uh, this is a page from my uh, notebook, and I don't, you probably can't even read that, uh, um, the, uh, where uh, the, the kinds of things that I was looking for, I mean, it seemed to me a bit like an art historical exercise, where you would, a kind of connoisseurship exercise, where you were trying to establish attribution, and you would look at things like facture, finish, um, uh, handedness, uh, um, use of form, and, so and I was trying to apply those kinds of ideas to uh, um, the hand axes I was looking at, and also bearing in mind that things that were close to each other were more likely to be associated than things that were far away from each other, and particularly if there were slight differences in, strateg in the um, geological place, in the stratigraphy, uh, then they were unlikely to be associated with each other. But so, um, uh, on, so on my list, there's morphology, stone, fine finish, decoration, um, uh, symmetry, um, uh, a shape, um, and uh, as uh, as Tommy indicated, we did this we did this exercise separately from one another. Uh, and, I, and then we kind of pooled our conclusions. Um, and um, to our surprise and uh, uh, enormous pleasure, uh, it turned out we could agree that there were, five of us could agree that the, there were groups that were, um, uh, where we could say these three were made by the same, we think these three were made by the same person. We think these three were made by another person. Uh, we think these two were made by the same person. We think these two were made by another person. Um, uh, that fact seems to me to be um, uh, rather wonderful and unprecedented because you uh, now not only have the fact that you know that people made hand axes, but there were individuals who made hand axes differently from each other, uh, and they had a kind of style. They had the, they had a way of doing things, and that um, uh, and that they were uh, they were makers in a sense that um, uh, that corresponds to the way we think of as makers. And these are these aren't us. Uh, uh, these are hominids. It's five hundred thousand years ago. There's, it's a long way from Homo sapiens. Um, but the uh, but what they're producing uh, and the kinds of mental apparatus they're bringing to bear on the things um, seems to be uh, uh, is something that we can recognize uh, and once we get into the hand uh, this is much later this is Peshmerl again um, then uh, we get into the hand uh, we enter not just a level of practicality we enter a we enter an imaginative universe um, in the same way as uh, it's Turner's fingerprint that identifies the Turner, um, but it's um, 
and the fingerprint is to do with his competence, uh, but the, the quality, the turner, is to do with his level of curiosity. So it's a combination of competence and curiosity that um, um, brings uh, his hominids at, at Boxgrove uh, into um, orbit with ourselves as artists. Um, and the last image uh, I've got, which I'm not going to, which I'm going to just briefly mention, because actually Nan is going to talk about this much more extensively. Uh, but this is the Berakram fi figure from uh, Israel, which I saw in '94, uh, and which for me triggered a lot of these uh, um, uh, these reflections. Um, this uh, uh, in the Israel Museum when this pebble is exposed, or it was uh, exhibited, uh, the title was The Oldest Woman in the World. Uh, and um, this is archaeologically, uh, this is dated from uh, roughly 300,000 years ago. It pushes the whole um, idea of uh, uh, figurative making uh, and and this is a uh, altered artifact it's not an it's not just a natural artifact uh, back really far beyond what we uh, uh, what we normally anticipate um, and uh, seeing it did uh, make me think can this be right um, can this really be as uh, everything it says it is. And if it does, it changes my worldview. And it did. And it has changed my worldview forever. Thank you. Our next presentation is called Crucial Brain Function, The Importance of Facial Recognition. Please welcome Dr. Leanne Young. So uh, sharing the stage with anthropologists, archaeologists, and artists has me as an engineer and a scientist remembering that game that used to be on Sesame Street. They'd show a bunch of things, and they'd say, which one of these is not like the others? <laughs> so, um, so I have to say that's been a real gift because this has been a great learning opportunity for me so far. Um, but I also have to say thank you to our first presenters today who really primed the pump for my particular presentation. I am going to be focusing on face processing. And as they mentioned, uh, face processing is really something that humans and even creatures predating humans and even my schnauzers are really good at. We have expertise in this. And it's worth just kind of looking at the why um, we might have this expertise. And, and then I'll leave it to some people smarter than I am, like people in this room, to think about how that expertise and that priority in face processing re is reflected in the artwork. I'm sorry? Okay. So, um, so when we talk about face processing, there is a very well-developed neurological system that we associate with face processing. And um, it's not to say that we have it all figured out, but we certainly have a fairly decent understanding of what's going on in our brains when we see a face. And this picture is a rather complex picture. So you can study the picture or you can just look at me as I wave my hands around my head to describe what's going on. But when we see a face, the signal comes into our eyes and that signal is transferred to the back of our heads to our occipital lobe for some early processing. From there, the signal goes to the occipital face area, which is really very early um, perceptual processing specifically of faces. From the occipital face area, the signal goes to two main places. The fusiform face area, which is kind of on the underside of our brain, and the superior temporal sulcus, which is more uh, kind of in a fold on the side of our brain. The fusiform face area is really used for, for processing static information about faces. So um, it's really important for identity. The superior temporal sulcus, on the other hand, is really important for the dynamic aspects of face processing. So when you think about dynamic aspects of face processing, what you should think about is emotional expression changing. You should think about eye gaze, 
where you're looking is important. And you should think also about lip reading. And in fact, there are some aspects of the face processing system that we call the extended face processing system, which are really important to all of those things. So when we have this perception of a face, the information goes from the back of the head to the occipital face area to the fusiform face area to the superior temporal sulcus. And from there, the information goes in a number of places to the extended face processing area. Some of the data is going to go to your auditory cortex, and that's because it's helpful to read lips in order to hear. Some of the information is going to go up in your parietal lobe, and it's going to help for directing and following the direction of somebody's gaze, so you know where they're looking. And then some of the data is going to go specifically to your amygdala. Now, your amygdala is sort of the emotional center for your brain, and it's part of the old brain. We call it the lizard brain. I mean, the amygdala is deep, deep in your brain, and it is ancient, and it really is the starting point for emotion. So as you can imagine, information related to the facial expression is going to go to that amygdala, and it's going to yield a response in your amygdala. Now, it was really interesting. One of the early pictures that we saw in the presentation, the first presentation this afternoon, was of the pebble. I don't think I could pronounce the full name of it, but the pebble. And, and we heard that in the picture, it kind of looked maybe a little bit more ferocious, and in real life, it looked a little bit kinder. Um, that is really an interesting thing, because what we're talking about there is even in this pebble, there's not just the perception that there's a face, but there's a perception that there's an emotional content to the expression of that face. That is because that face processing function is key to our ability to function socially. Now, as far as the evolution of face processing, I'll be honest, we actually don't know that much. So I'm not going to talk a lot about it. But I will say that when we study our face processing system, we do so looking not just at humans, but looking back extensively at the macaque, which we sort of diverged from a number of years ago, maybe 25 million years ago. And, and you can see that the brains, if you look on the very bottom, the brains of the macaque are, are not as folded, not as complex as our brains. And, and you can see in the middle that we kind of smooth the brains out to look at them. So the sulces are kind of dark and the, and the gyri, which are the bumps, are a little bit lighter. But you can see you spread them out and, and there are little highlighted dots that show that we have found in the macaque regions that are doing the same thing as the face processing regions that I just talked about in the human brain. And in fact, their location as much as possible, given that you know the monkey brain is smaller and different than our brain, their location is pretty similar. And then most recently, we've gone even further back, another 10 million years, and looked at the marmoset brain. And you can see on the bottom left, it is really, really smooth. It's really small, not a whole lot of frontal lobe action there. Nevertheless, it also has several regions that do appear to have the function of those face processing regions in our brain. Now, what's key in, in differentiating these is in the human brain, a lot more real estate's going toward face processing. And in particular, you see a lot of real estate going to the dynamic face processing. So that thing called lip reading, probably not so important to a marmoset, critical to human. So you can see that we have more real estate for face processing, but we also have just a much more complex brain using that information. So we saw, <laughs> we saw some, some examples of this. Jesus and the toast is not the first time that we've seen a face in something that was just a natural object. And I'm so grateful to that first presentation that gave you better examples than anything I was going to find on the internet. But the fact is, it has been it has always been true that we will see faces in inanimate objects. That's a natural human thing. And you go, why, why would we do that? Well, the fact is, we're really good at seeing faces. We're so good at seeing faces, we see them where they are not. Um, so it's really just a very human thing. And, and just as an aside, um, as I was doing a little bit of research, I learned something that I hadn't known. The car industry actually uses this. Cars that have sort of more of a, a face on the grill they sell better. So humans are a little bit strange, are we not? When we look at faces, we process them in an interesting way. So I put this up here to give you an example and help you to see the different way in which we process faces for maybe some other things. 
Can anybody here tell me, and if you've seen this before, you're not allowed to raise your hand, what's unusual about these spaces other than the fact that they're upside down? Yeah, some people spot that, some people don't. You can spot it, but you can't fully appreciate how weird that is until I turn the faces up right side up. There's a reason for that. We have in our brains some efficiencies that we build up, in, and this is in general. Our brains operate on efficiency. We learn to do things better by patterns. So we have a mental map of a face. But our mental map of the face is based upon a face that's oriented similarly to our own. So when we encounter a face or a piece of toast with a face-like thing that's oriented the right way, we process that as a face pretty quickly in a holistic way. So we're not processing, ooh, there's one eye and then another eye, and look, I found a nose. We're just seeing a face. In fact, when you saw the pebble at the first briefing, you looked at the pebble and you went, oh, there's a face. And then you started studying it more, and you went, oh, those are the eyes. But your first reaction was, there's a face. That's how we process. Now, when you turn the face upside down, that's not what our mental map looks like, because we don't go around encountering people upside down. And so when you turn it upside down, instead of processing the face in a sort of holistic way, you process the features, features in an individual way. So you see the eyes, you see the mouth, you see the nose, but you don't really process them relative to each other. You just see the individual features. So that's one of the reasons why we don't necessarily process the faces the same way when they're upside down. We really do look at the faces in somewhat a holistic way and experience them initially in that way. Now, of course, the, the first and foremost function of face processing is going to be identity or recognition. This is a face. What, there are a couple nuances about this that are interesting. Um, how we come to recognize faces and what we come to identify as a prototypical face is going to depend on exposure. So in fact, if you are exposed primarily to a Caucasian face, your expertise is going to be in processing Caucasian faces. If your primary exposure is to Asian faces, your expertise is in processing Asian faces. Now the implication of this is that we do a better job of individuating faces of our own race than another race. If, however, you're a Caucasian raised in a community of Asians, and this, is, this could be any race, I just happened to pick out an Asian race here, then you will process and individuate Asian races better because you've had a lot of exposure. Vice versa, if you're Asian and you're raised in a predominantly Caucasian environment, your parents are Caucasian or your nanny's Caucasian and the friends are Caucasian, you will individu individuate Caucasian faces better. This isn't a matter of racism, it's a matter of mental maps that we create. Another thing that's interesting about our mental maps is that prototypical face helps us to identify what's attractive. And it is generally true across really all cultures that symmetry is associated with attractiveness. And in fact, there's some ideas that the reason for that is symmetry is also associated with healthiness. So attractiveness is going to tend to be in a more symmetric face, which gives me a bit of trouble. So another reason why face processing is important is emotional recognition. And really, the heart and soul of emotional recognition is, in fact, the amygdala. But it's interesting. There's a couple different ways in which we recognize emotions. One of them is the, what we call the cortical root. That's the root I described at the beginning, where the data goes from the eyes to the back of the head, to the occipital face area, the fusiform face area, the superior temporal sulcus, and all that goes to the amygdala. And the amygdala forms an opinion about the emotional expression. And the amygdala can be fairly nuanced in doing so. And it takes some time to do so. It happens what we call superliminal, not subliminal, but superliminal. And, and the, the perception of the emotional expression is fairly detailed. We can tell the difference between afraid and surprised angry, happy, we can, we can really pick up those nuances and we can do so fairly consistently and we can do so across cultures. So we're really good at that with a lot of detail, but there is also a secondary route and that's really exciting because the secondary route, basically the data goes from the eyes to something called the superior temporal sulcus, which is labeled SC in this drawing, and then from there it goes to the amygdala, bypasses all that other stuff. When it bypasses all that other stuff, what you have is much more coarse data, 
but you much more quickly, 20 to 30 milliseconds, have the amygdala reacting. So in a subliminal way, you're still processing the emotional expressions. Now this is totally aside, but it's kind of cool. There are people who are face blind. For one reason or another, the fusiform face area isn't doing its job, and they will not recognize faces. Those people who don't recognize faces will still recognize highly valenced emotional expressions on faces. How strange is that? They don't recognize a face, but if somebody's angry, they can tell. Now, the thing about that is that is really going straight to that old brain. And that really only works with highly valenced expressions. For a long time, they thought it only worked for really, really fearful expressions. Now, I'll turn to the anthropologists and, and let them think about the significance of that. As an amateur, I go, gosh, you know, if I, if I go back and I'm, I'm an ancient um, hominoid, I'll just say hominoid, I'm an ancient hominoid, I'm going to want to make sure if somebody's afraid, I recognize that quick because that is important to me and my survival. That might mean there's a threat. Or a highly valent face that's really, really angry is going to be pretty important to me because that's relevant to my survival. So I, I kind of wonder if that in some way um, is a reason for that subcortical root. But then again, amateur hour here if I try to be an anthropologist. So I'm going to um, end with um, yet another interesting aspect of our face processing. And this one's one that seems to kind of go awry. So I really want the anthropologist to work with us on this. Um, one of the things we do when we see faces is we make face-based trait evaluations. Based upon somebody's face, we form an opinion about what their personality is. Not only do we do this, but we all do this, all of us. Nobody escapes. Interestingly enough, we all do this consistently. So consistently, in fact, that you can predict the outcome of an election based upon face-based trade evaluations with an accuracy of 0.7 on a scale from 0 to 1. You can predict the outcome of an election. We are consistent. In fact, I'll just show you a fun example from our primaries. I know, you bring in politics and it gets nervous in the room, doesn't it? <laughs> It's so, okay, we're not going to get political here. Actually, we're going to stick to the neuroscience and cognitive science. What you see here is on the left, Marco Rubio. Well, your left, yeah. Marco Rubio, throughout the primaries, he was one of about, what, 12 candidates on the Republican side? Throughout the primaries, you heard over and over again how young he was. Do you all remember that? He was young, inexperienced. Could he be president? He's so young. You never heard that about Ted Cruz. You heard other criticisms, I'll admit. But you did not hear a criticism of him being too young. You also didn't hear that these men are just months apart in age. So now why is it that there was this perception that Marco Rubio was too young to be competent, and yet somebody the same age, nobody had a problem with? Well, the answer to that is face-based trade evaluations. As I said, we're very consistent in them. And Marco Rubio has what you call a baby face. And baby faces are associated with warmth, friendliness, integrity, but not competence. And as it turns out, when we say that face-based trade evaluations can predict the outcome of elections, it's specifically the evaluation of competence that predicts the outcome of elections. So if I was on Marco Rubio's team, I would have told him straight up, you need to put gray in your hair, Grow a little bit of a beard and put on some glasses. you got to cover up the baby face. But they didn't really think in those terms. But, and for some reason, nobody came and asked me either. The last point I want to make about these face-based trade evaluations is that they're wrong. There's no data whatsoever showing that these face-based trade evaluations we make have any relationship to the actual personality traits that we assume. And it's interesting because these can be really important in terms of social function. We make face-based trade evaluations about somebody's trustworthiness, and that can influence how we receive the message they deliver. It can influence whether we're willing to work with them. That's pretty important. In ancient times, when you're in a tribe and you meet somebody from the other tribe, if your face-based trade evaluation is this person's untrustworthy, 
then they're a threat. And yet, our face-based trade evaluations have no real meaning behind them. So anthropologists and archaeologists got to help me understand this one. It's fascinating, and it's exciting, and it's an opportunity for us to understand better human nature. But when I said that we do this and they're not accurate and that we all do it, I also said you can't escape it. And the reason I said that is these face-based trade evaluations happen in roughly 33 milliseconds. So within 33 milliseconds of me standing up here, you all formed an opinion about me. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> but you did form an opinion about me. And everything I said thereafter was affected by that opinion. So that opinion in 33 milliseconds happened in less than a third of the time it takes to blink your eye. Now what do we do about this as human beings? Well, it turns out we have a frontal lobe. Thank the Lord for the frontal lobe. We know now that because we make these face-based trade evaluations so quickly that we don't even realize we're doing it, that we could, the people in this room, could learn from that and say, you know what, when I meet somebody and my first reaction is, Ugh. perhaps I should listen. Perhaps I should turn on my frontal lobe, engage it, listen to this person, get to know them, and find out who they are and what they're about. So um, I'd like to close with that thought. And um, during the panel discussion, I'd be happy, thrilled to answer any questions you have. But I will close with my favorite face in the world. <laughs> so thank you. Our final presentation this afternoon will be with Dr. Nama Gorin Imbar. The topic will be early hominin hunter-gatherers at Gesher Banat Yaakov. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nama Gorin Imbar. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the last one. And if I have to uh, speak about hunter-gatherers, we'll stay here for about 16 days. Uh, so, two things. First of all, I would like to thank very much Tony and Tom for inviting me and all the people of the National Center because this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, my lecture is going to be uh, quite dull because in a foreign language you cannot really use your humor in the same way that you do it in your original language. Um, my lecture is going to be a little bit different uh, because you've heard a lot about aesthetics and you have heard a lot about art and I would like to be very rustic now and take you a little bit on a tour which is beyond the end product which is the handex, something which is a, a little uh, different. Uh, in this slide uh, you see handexes and cleavers, this is part of the Archelian culture, we are all aware of it now. And I would like to dedicate my talk today to the fact that uh, a lot of what you see of the handexes are made on large flakes. And these large flakes were extracted from large cores. And I think if we can go through and see the large cores uh, and the process which uh, takes you to the end of the final shape uh, and the aesthetics of the handex, we can learn something about the hominins uh, who were engaged in and doing all of the things. In order to make a large flakes, you have to take really a big core and, and uh, extract a big flake from it. So this is how it's done. And uh, of course, you have to have a big hammerstone and then give it a blow in order to get the large flake. And then the process of making the uh, handex uh, starts. Uh, we can uh, learn about the brains, not the actual brain, but what the brain abilities were through different uh, forms and different uh, types of evidence. Um, we can learn it through the material culture and we can learn through the uh, subsistence in the case of the site I'm going to describe, um, through the flora, what they ate, how they gathered it, what they processed, how they processed it. And we can learn about the fauna. What was the favorable stake? And uh, what were the, uh, the least uh, favorable stake? And uh, how much they consumed? What were the processes that, that took place? But today, because of uh, the tiredness in the hall, I will speak only about the material culture. I would like to take you to the site of Geshob Notiakov. Where are we? Here. 
Mm, not sure. Okay. Uh, the site of Geshev Not Yaakov in Israel is located in the Dead Sea Rift. And the Dead Sea Rift is a, continues, a, a, a continuation of the African Great Rift System that John was talking about. And most of the sites that John showed came from that same rift, but farther to the south in, in Africa. And here in our part of the world, we have, maybe I should use something different. Uh, this is the rift, and uh, we shall um, see two sites. The first site, Ubudia, I want just to mention it. It's, it's uh, on the route out of Africa, all along the uh, Jordan Rift Valley, as you see. And the big spheroid, the big limestone spheroid, which is an exhibit, is coming from this site. The age of this site is about uh, 1.6 million years old. Uh, the site that I'm going, the figurine, the last... Uh, uh, figure that we saw two lectures ago came from this site. It's a little bit off uh, the, the rift. And I'm going to speak about Geshob Not Yaakov. Geshob Not Yaakov is located in the northernmost basin of uh, the rift in the Hula Basin. It used to have a, a very long uh, lasting um, lake which was drained in the 50s of last century. But please imagine that the depth that we don't see of this uh, valley is about nine kilometers. So during a lot of time of the history, a lot of water uh, was building up, coming into this huge hole. And of course, we are now, uh, we'll speak about the, the edges of this um, huge lake that existed for millions of, of years. Uh, the problem, you know, the Middle East is, is a problematic area, and I think all of you read papers and, and see it. But the, the Hula Valley is here, and the site is stretches for about three and a half kilometers. This is really the dimensions of an African site. Uh, the excavations, my excavations took place over here. But this is, the, this is the tiny, this tiny little drizzle is the Holy Jordan River. And everything to the east of the river is uh, the Saudian plate. Everything west is the, uh, is the African or the Egyptian plate. And these two plates are bouncing against each other, causing a lot of problems, both to the site of Ubadia and the younger site of Geshe Not Yaakov. And you can see here uh, as what we have to face. Because of all this bouncing of the plate te tectonics, um, everything is deformed, and all the archaeological horizons that we excavated are tilted. Not only they are tilted, they are also waterlogged. So you see the pipe here. We had to pump all the water on one hand and then spray a lot of water in order to conserve all the wealth of the organic uh, material that uh, we have found at the site. So um, you can see here that um, the duration of the Ashelian culture in Israel is about from 1.6 to about 3 100,000, but I'm going to limit my words to a, a time range between million and perhaps uh, 780,000 years. This is what we came up uh, with uh, uh, our investigations. You, you have a sequence here. This, uh, we are on the edge of the lake. Sometimes the lake is higher up and we get all kinds of clays, uh, like here. Uh, other times, we have, uh, when the lake comes down, we have sands. And other times, uh, it's, the lake is farther away, and we get con conglomerates. From top to bottom of these 34 meters, we have Achelian records. We have about uh, 22 uh, layers, uh, actually Achelian sites, superimposed one on top of the other. And all of them, all these um, uh, triangles, indicate the location where we found sites. Uh, this line over here is um, the Bruns Matuyama boundary chrome. This is a global phenomena that everything uh, from uh, here and upwards means that in those times, um, the magnetic uh, field um, was pointing to the north. And everything from down here, uh, the magnetic field flipped 
and was pointing to the south. This is, this is a very well-known geological uh, phenomenon and not very well understood even, I hope there's no physicist in the, in the <laughs> audience. Anyhow, uh, the richest sites that uh, we're going to speak about uh, are here and they are all have bifaces and they, from, from here to the top, we're discussing about 50,000 years. The estimation is 50,000 years and that's uh, what is the material that I'm going uh, to discuss here. In this slide, for example, you see again the tilted, the, oops, sorry. You, you see the tilted um, slope of the ar archaeological horizon. You see an elephant skull, and under the elephant skull you see a, a, a wooden log, and this log is an oak, and we have a lot of pieces of oak among other things. Imagine that this piece of oak is not fossil, it's actually um, soft, and you can see the annual rings when you cut it through. So this is really amazing. But what uh, for our concern today, these big lumps are pieces of basalt. And from these big lumps of basalt, the hominins extracted the large flakes on which they formed the cleavers and the handexes. And this handex, basalt handex, was found immediately on top of the uh, elephant skull. If I look at all the record of GBY, or that's how we call the Geshe Mnot Yaakov uh, in short, uh, these are the oldest uh, sites and these are the youngest sites and every time you see this yellow mark, it means that there are handexes and cleavers. And you can see that it's not consistent. Sometimes you have a lot and other times you have very few. And this is a final product, a, a three-dimensional uh, visualized of, of uh, uh, one of these uh, handexes. And now the question is, how did they go about uh, making them? I take you to East Africa, for example, for, for a moment, to see the site uh, of Ologezaili, a quarry site, and you can see big slabs, and you can see, I mean, thick slabs, and you can see thin slabs. All the uh, handexes from Geshob Not Yaakov were made on this uh, thick uh, slabs, and it took a lot of energy and a lot of muscles, but primarily a lot of knowledge in order to, to, do, to go uh, about it. Uh, there is a particular type of selection. And I would like to say that during all our studies, we used a lot of experimental archaeology in order to get a better understanding of what was going on when we look at the uh, uh, artifacts. So this is a, a, a section in a, a basalt flow next to the site, a, a modern section, I should say. And you see here in the illustration that the, the, the slabs, the basalt slabs, uh, are coming, they are best without any vesicles, without any gas uh, things. They are coming from the middle section of the flow. The flow usually is about 8 to 10 meters thick. And you can see here uh, the experimenter uh, uh, handling such uh, uh, a slab, and he's a very strong man. In the next three uh, slides, I would like to show you three different options that we have come to learn that people at GBY in the di different uh, horizons, which I would say um, spend about uh, 50,000 years, different techniques that all occur in all the horizons. And these are the ways in which the large flakes that will turn into handexes and cleavers uh, were made. How the people handled these labs the large slabs in order to extract a, an appropriate flake. The cores are flaked bifacial. One flake scar serves as the striking platform for the next detachment. This process is repeated sequentially. So this was the first uh, type of work. And you can see that the, it handled the, the slab in a particular manner. Now comes the second. Kombewa cores. This technology involves detaching a very large flake from a core. Then the flake was used as a core to detach a predetermined flake. 
And this, this te technique, for example, is very well known from the African sites and the, all the way to India to, uh, and, and in the middle in, in some sites. Uh, the third one. Slicing technology. Using another technology, cores could be sliced continuously to detach suitable thin flakes. This technique had several variations. Further Okay, so each of these three techniques yielded large flakes uh, to be transformed into biofaces. And there is another technique, which is called the Levalo technique. And this is the technique that will rule the world when the Achelians will pass away. Around uh, 300,000 years ago, this technique will be the leading thing. All the Neanderthals will be using it, and modern, ancient modern humans will be using it, and so on and so forth. So all these four techniques, and this is what I have in, at the site. But we assume that there were at least one or more techniques that uh, were added to this repertoire uh, uh, in order to fulfill what they do. And here is the final uh, stage of making a biphase, when you're already working on the symmetry and on the aesthetics and on the shaping, the final shaping of, of the, the handex. So in what I've shown you all the way uh, now is only a, a very small component of what we know about how people treated stones at the site because they also worked on flint, they also worked on limestone, and this is only on their work on, on basalt. They start from looking for an appropriate material and they go all the way to what they actually wish to do. To do. So you have cleavers, if you plan to do a cleaver, you go through a particular way. If you want to do a handex, you go uh, on a particular way. And there are also other things that I don't have time to discuss uh, in this lecture. So the planning and the different stages. And here, you see, I, I wrote here giant cores, but I've just showed you that there are at least four different types of giant cores that were simultaneously used in these archaeological horizons. So it needs sophistication. It's not only a question of the art, excuse me, but it's also a question of the technology, of the ability, of the planning, of doing all these things together. Uh, my student, Gadi Herzlinger, is a, a bright guy, and he developed a, a program that can show you what is the variability. Previous talks here talked about an attempt to try and identify the person uh, or the persons that were engaged. In, in this uh, graph over here, you have more than 60 different handexes depicted uh, based on uh, geomorphic, uh, on, the, on the general shape. Uh, in here, you have more than 120 bifaces. The, the um, blue color means that there is a lot of uh, similarity. The red colors, on the other hand, uh, means that there is more variability. And now we are uh, in the stage that we really have a better grasp on the variability. And this, remember that all these um, handexes are a result of using large flakes. And look how, what were the fantastic expertise of these people that most of the handexes uh, look alike in, in the uh, blue color, and only these particular zones uh, in this at least two different archaeological sites uh, are, are showing some variability, and this variability is actually dependent on the particular method that the big cores were using. Okay, so here we go another. And looking at uh, uh, John's slides, you saw hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, handexes on the surface. This is uh, uh, one part of, of the excavations at GBY, one horizon. There are about 13.5 handexes to the square meter. Okay, so they were doing something. Many people were doing, a single person was doing, uh, are they caching the things? There are many, many questions to uh, be done uh, with. Okay, so I tried to show that the hominins were not dumb. 
People speak about Neanderthals sometimes as dumb people, but the Australians were quite sophisticated. They had a lot of, uh, uh, they had advanced planning, they knew about different things, they had a long memory, uh, not only for the location of the, work of the workshops and the quarries, but also for the final design that they wanted to, to show. And there was an expert cognition because they really knew what they're doing. This John can, uh, um, sorry, Tom can uh, speak in length, but not me. And, and another, for the final thing, another aspect, which is not uh, associated with the technology, is uh, the behavior on the landscape. And in this picture, you can see where the hearth, where the, where the fire was uh, placed in at least two, pla two areas in the same horizon. And you can see that there were lots of hammerstones over here. And of, of great interest are the little um, uh, yellow circles, which are the final removals shaping the hammerstone. So this is very similar to uh, a groups of uh, hominins of modern humans in the Kalahari or, or in other places. They're sitting around the fire and they're napping and they're talking and they have a lot of social interaction and, and they do these uh, tasks uh, usually together. So uh, with this, I thank you all very much and uh, hope to hear. The next portion of our program will be a moderated roundtable discussion followed by Q&A, but first let's take a brief break. If you'll join us back here in five minutes, we'll reconvene. <laughs>